So today I'm going to tell you about this project of mine that I call Digital Twins for Ocean Robots. Um, and it's sort of one of my more sort of extensive uh, projects with Julia yet. Um, involves a lot of packages, so I'll get to that. But I will start by just introducing the concept and the motivation for this work. Um, the century is going to be about you know, using real observations, accessing them, leveraging them, and then simulating them on, on a computer using Julia, um, and interacting with all of this. Um, so that's the way I've brought up the, the plantation. What are digital twins? It's a phrase that's used in a lot of different contexts, and everybody has kind of their own definitions. So just for the record, this is the one I'm going to use today. Um, so a digital twin is going to be a pairing. Um, it's going to be a computer representation of real systems and an interaction uh, that we can interact with. Um, and there's, you know, built in, there must be a two-way connection framework between the real system and the virtual one. Uh, the goal being to enable mutual benefits, typically. Um, in my, my presentation and this work, the, the real system is both the climate system being you know, warmed up by us um, and the observing system that goes on top of it. So that's the real system. So I want to reproduce all of that in a virtual world, meaning I want to start from a model of climate scenarios propagate that all the way through in the oceans, in my case, to see what happens on the marine ecosystems, and generate virtual observations of this. So this is for the setting of the stage. Um, like I said, there are reasons we do this, and typically there are these mutual benefits between observations and, and modeling. Uh, so I've given you a list here. It's not meant to be ex you know, um, exhaustive. <clears throat> but the first one is probably what comes to mind most immediately, data simulation, machine learning, and, and training models of data that fits naturally in this sort of framework. Um, more simply, scientific interpretation of data, you need models and vice versa. Um, one of the things that we want to do with this sort of framework that I'm going to talk about is also think about you know, optimizing an observational strategy for you know, looking at the climate system. So this is a, you know, a, a feedback and a, a learning about the way that we should deploy observations. Uh, we want to do this for a range of climate scenarios so that we know that our monitoring system is adequate for that, regardless of what happens. Um, and there's applications to the line of you know, active controls of um, robots when they are at sea as well. So this is more kind of um, in real time. Um, in the field type of thing, uh, where we also want to be able to provide kind of an augmented reality from the model to the data. So a, lo a, lot list, a long list of things we can do with these sort of things. Um, here's kind of my one slide to represent data simulation um, or machine learning. You create a scenario with a perturbed climate in this case. You're looking at maps of ocean circulations. Um, generate a system, um, like simulate an observing system for that. Apply a estimation workflow of some sort. In my case, this is adjoint based um, curve fitting of a, a general circulation model to data, and then evaluate the performance. Right? So what you're seeing on the right hand side is a decrease of error due to the data simulation, where we show that the data is going to improve uh, the estimates of the real ocean. So doing this in a virtual world is nice because we know what the truth actually is. So we can actually qualify the results and prove that it may work in reality. So that's why we want to do this sort of things in a twin world. Um, and this is also an opportunity to say that one of the reasons I think Julia is great for all this sort of work is that there is a rich ecosystem of very powerful methods to the, you know, um, from Bayesian estimation to, <clears throat> to neural networks to all sorts of uh, Kalman filtering and, and, and so on. So um, this is what we will leverage ultimately. Another piece of motivation for me doing this work is climate change. So just looking at these two plots you see on the left, uh, the way that the climate uh, has been warming up. This is from satellite data, right? Uh, not an ocean robot, but a space robot in this case. Um, and on the right hand side is the projection in the future. Um, the time scale being quite a bit longer. And so we want to sort of look at those two things combined. Uh, but the urgency to do this sort of work really comes from, we have a huge problem on our hands the planet is burning up, you've heard the news this summer. Um, 
and we need to we need to be good about you know monitoring it, doing the best job we can to do that, and detect the issues that propagate through the system. The third thing that brought me to this is a workshop I did last year with uh, folks that are more involved with ocean robots themselves, and so this was the. Uh, 2022 Symposium on Advances in Ocean Observations. The goal was to bring uh, together a small group of um, experts um, focusing on smarter methods of ocean observation and with the aim to generate ideas across science and technology and advance ocean observation in novel ways. And so what I came up with is, well, let's do this in Julia. Here is a framework that you can use to um, evaluate, demonstrate your new concepts of observation and, and make the case that they are going to help us and so on. And so in a way, you know, it's this meeting last year that really motivated me in putting my thoughts into this. Um, and I look forward to working with these great folks. Right, so we're going to talk about ocean robots, real ones and simulated ones. So real ocean robots, what are they? Um, well, I wrote this little package called Ocean Robots Geo, um, partly to access the data and then to build this project forward. Um, what you will find in this package is a set of uh, notebooks that are all listed here, most of them, uh, that access different kind of data sets. And so based on this work, now we now have a bridge between all of this data and Julia, essentially. Um, and they're in the form of notebooks because I care very much about the interactivity. I'll show you a few examples to make things more concrete. Uh, the first thing you might wonder about is what's the state of the observing system, the monitoring system today, and so there are uh, tools for that. Um, and specifically, we can query databases that have all of the metadata of what's going on. And so this is what this notebook does. And it shows in the different colors, different kind of, uh, of instruments, uh, which I will tell you a bit more about later. Um, you see that it's fairly complex. There's a lot of different um, colors and, and things that are deployed. Uh, it's a huge amount of investment, of course. This is some you know, a global effort to observe the climate system. So this is sort of the, the big picture. And then if we zoom in a bit, you're going to have different types of ocean robots. Here's one that maybe um, is the simplest to understand. It's uh, just a, a instrument that is anchored to the bottom and has a bunch of instruments on it, um, measuring, measuring devices. Uh, so you have a picture on the left. Uh, this is data sets from um, the, the NOAA. Um, and you see on this um, a bunch of things at the top, which are like little sensors. And you see people maintaining this thing. Um, so the notebook on the right, which is from the Ocean Robots GL collection, uh, gets this data set, and it's got 25 year time series of temperature that I'm looking at, and just computes a little histogram of how much uh, the ocean has warmed up over a 25 year period, and that would be the histogram that's in the top left here. Um, so this is something you can you know, pick whatever uh, buoy around the US, uh, they are deployed uh, around our coastline, and get this sort of information right away uh, through this notebook. So I'd, I'd say this is a stationary robot uh, in a way. We have other things like this one. Uh, here the picture on the left should suggest to you that this is a little smaller. It's a little device that people can just uh, throw off of the, of the ship. And these guys, um, these drifting robots, they are very important in measuring ocean currents. Um, they have um, they've been deployed globally. And so the typical information we get from them is what's in the, in the middle panel, uh, where you see this uh, pattern of, of um, motion. Um, this is a longitude latitude plan, um, where we follow the trajectory of this uh, robot. So this is the type of things that we're going to try and simulate, the trajectory of these things, when they're exposed to a set of flow fields in the ocean, the ocean currents, and could be also in the atmosphere, in fact. Um, so drifting robots. And then just one step further, we have um, this set of so-called drifting profilers or profiling floats. 
which already become the, the backbone of our observing of climate uh, today. And so this is one that uh, drifts at a certain point and certain depth, but also goes down and up to make a continuous measurement of temperature and salinity in this case. And so it leads to the kind of data set you have here at the bottom right. Um, so temperature versus uh, time and depth. Um, and again, we now have notebooks to just query that and, and get this sort of data set and start simulating them. Uh, in fact, this data set is important enough that I decided to put in a separate package, which is called Argo Data Jail. The QR code, as in other places in my presentation, will lead you to it. All right. Um, so this was for um, the modeling, the, sorry, the uh, accessing and, and using uh, of real data uh, from those ocean robots. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the simulation part. And this is where um, the SciML um, software comes, comes into play a fair amount. Um, so this is done typically through a package that I've called individual displacements of GL, uh, which takes a set of flow fields or um, um, a term that says how much you're going to move something um, and, and uses that through a differential equation solver. And so the equations that are just uh, written here they are the same, just slightly different. Uh, the idea is on the left-hand side, you have the derivative of position. So that's displacement. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you have the flow field, which would be the ocean currents. Maybe you can take that from the climatology if you don't have it from um, the data. Uh, we can combine different sets of uh, products to get something that's realistic at different scales, so on and so forth. And so you can start playing um, games with those virtual um, observing platforms. The second line is just meant to say that, you know, on top of it, you can add active um, components to the, to the right-hand side, things like flotability to move something up and down, or propulsion. In some cases, some, um, some of the technologies we use do propel. And uh, yeah, so that part is sort of covered. So now we have the simulation of the platforms. The next part is the sensor. So what are they observing? What are they sampling? Uh, and so for this, there's a series of different uh, packages that I use and are listed here. MeshArrays is something I presented in 2018 at Julacon, actually, uh, to handle gridded model output. Um, ocean state estimation is a package that gives me um, gridded variables from Earth's observation. In fact, we talked about this sort of things a little bit uh, in a previous session today. Um, we organized the, the Julia for Earth Observation workshop. Um, if you want to take a look, that's, that's going to be online soon. Um, climate model GL is what I use to uh, run climate scenarios and embed all of this. And then ultimately, we also want to consider uh, models of the marine ecosystem because that's one of the, of the key things we try to, to keep track of is how much are we disrupting marine life um, through warming the planet and, and other issues. So this is that, and a couple of quick examples. Um, so this is using, as I said, individual displacement gel uh, to simulate the drifting voice. Here, every one of those lines um, represents a trajectory of a virtual particle put into the flow field. Um, there are certain interesting patterns here, but you might notice that the lines converge in some places. That's important because that's where the so-called great plastic patch is accumulating a lot of the garbage that unfortunately we also put in the ocean. Um, so this to say, um, this work has also implications for marine pollution. And in the first place, we have ways to simulate um, these pathways of ocean robots. Here is for my drifting profiler example. So here again, we have a, in this case, a three-dimensional flow field, dump a bunch of virtual particles in there, advec them, that's what's on the left-hand side, and then we start generating profile data of temperature and salinity, um, which is what's on the right hand side along the trajectory. So once we have all those things together, we have our virtual um, ocean robots, and then what we are left to do is embed them in climate scenarios and so on. So I'm not going to go into much more about 
this part, but I'm going to highlight interactivity uh, because I think it's one of the places where the Julia ecosystem makes it a very good case that it should be used for these sort of things. Um, and so I'm going to highlight a few things. Um, one is, let me go out of this and see, because since I'm going to show interactivity, I might as well do it on the screen. Um, so I'm a big fan of Pluto Notebooks um, for that reason that they let you interact with models um, and data uh, in an interactive way and communicate about them. So here is an example of you know, a model that's in fact C++ model that I run through the climate model GL package, um, which we will talk about in a different session in, uh, at 420. Um, it generates a bunch of um, climate scenarios and then you, know, you, can, you can start interacting with uh, the models in a simple way through changing parameters and text files. So for example, here I did this little perturbation to it. Uh, if I change, uh, let me change this. Right, and then you just rerun the model. And if you go, you have a, there we go. Um, now you have a different climate. So you can start generating different climates like this. And then here's an example where I combine this climate scenario with real data. Uh, so this is also a way to illustrate the use of the Earth observation packages. And, and so this gets SST from, uh, sorry, sea surface temperature. Um, from observations, from satellite data. And then what this notebook does is it says, okay, let's, let's say that we are now in 2023. And we have a scenario that we've chosen depending on what we do to the, to the planet in the future. And it's advanced, you know, 50 or 60 years or whatever, just to see the warming happen. And now we have our, you know, our virtual climates to observe. This last one is the, um, the particle tracking uh, that I've mentioned before. And so here again, you know, you can start playing with the, the notebooks and all of a sudden you're doing like interactive science. Um, so here the blue points are the original position and they get moved. Um, so Pluto notebooks, a great asset. Um, another one that I really love for um, interacting with data and models is um, Maki. And so I'm going to show you a bit of this, um, where you show the rest. Um, so the great thing about Mackie is, well, there's many great things about Mackie, but one of them is it has this interactive uh, interactivity built in. Uh, so this is GL Mackie, which I'm going to show you. And that comes very handy because we want to be able to access large data sets. Um, so this is a placeholder for that. Uh, this is from a kilometer scale uh, model. Um, that's a Fortran model at this point. Uh, but it's the same things that the Klima program is doing uh, in Julia. And so that's the interactivity I'm talking about. What you're looking at are those kind of kilometer scale um, gradients of temperature from this pretty large data set. So based on these tools, the Julia ecosystem and Mackie specifically here, we are able to you know, interact with this, these large data sets and kind of query them and, and, and go back and forth. There's one thing that you know, may be a bit disappointing here is it's, it's kind of girls grained. Um, that had been resolved in a sense um, by the creation of the Tyler.jl package, which I'm going to also highlight briefly here. Uh, so I don't know if you've seen this. This is the same tool that's used for OpenStreetMap uh, kind of applications. And so this is nice because now it's interpolating on the fly and it lets you query, like explore these global fields. And I'm starting from very local and just zooming out. Right, and then you can start looking at these big data sets and just go in with the interpolation on the fly. So I think this is a, a really nice addition to the ecosystem that I wanted to highlight. And it's the sort of uh, user experience that I'm after, essentially, being able to provide a complicated workflow that starts from running a climate model, querying a bunch of other data sets that may be massive along the way, doing it all interactively, and doing science afterwards. So this was my presentation for today. Um, to just leave it to that. Um, 
it's a project that leverages a lot of Julia packages. And I have to say I'm indebted to a lot of you here probably uh, in that regard. Uh, the set of packages that I've uh, deployed and, and discussed today um, leverage, um, well, give you access to real ocean data sets. And they also provide you the means to simulate them. And so they, they form the backbone of, of this digital twin framework that I'm uh, envisioning. And I've showcased the interactivity that Julia enables around this, which is going to be key. Thank you. Um, all of this to open new avenues of ocean and climate science, um, hopefully also influence policy. You'll find all of this um, on GitHub. Um, best place to start is probably my own sort of GitHub uh, profile. A lot of the packages that I've described are um, spread across two organizations, um, Julia Climate and Julia Ocean. We're always looking for contributors. And so if you are interested in these sort of things, you know, please do. Uh, join us. And at the bottom, I've just highlighted some of the other organizations that uh, play a big role in what I'm doing for this. Um, so SciML, Pluto, and Naki in particular. Uh, but I should also have mentioned you know, Julia Geo and, and organizations like that. Um, that's all. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll take any questions you have. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions from the audience? Thank, thank you for this, for this talk. It's very wonderful. But uh, you wanted to highlight the interactivity, but papers aren't really interactive. Is this something that could be done a bit differently in the future with sharing these kinds of awesome interactive tools? Uh, you said papers? Yeah, like publications. Oh, I see. Um, well, publications are a bit, you depend on the editors, right? So it's sort of, um, the answer sort of depends who you're talking about in a sense. There are, there are journals that are pretty good at supporting interactive computation already. Um, one thing that, you know, I didn't touch much about or discuss much is cloud computing in general. Um, I'm a, I'm kind of a fan of that in, in the way of not necessarily paying for it, but in the way of distributing um, materials through that. Um, and I like, for example, Docker as a way to instantiate it on your local machine without you know, asking AWS for, uh, for services. Um, so I think, you know, I'm, I think the way to make scientific publications interactive, more interactive and reproducible. Uh, is by providing recipes that are reproducible, archiving data sets on like, you know, permanent archives with DOIs, and then providing the computational environment, uh, if not the electricity and the computer power itself. Make sense? Yeah, cool, thank you. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, so, are there any methods for monitoring uh, coral bleaching trends around the world as part of, as part of the Julia Climate Library? Sorry, can you, can you please repeat the beginning? Uh, yeah, so, um, are there any methods of monitoring coral bleaching trends around the world using uh, Julia, uh, Julia Climate or Julia Ocean? Oh, coral bleaching. Okay, sorry. So, thank you. Um, so, this is not something that's explicitly addressed yet. It's a good one to add. Um, one topic, though, that is really directly related is um, um, the work with the Julia uh, for Earth Observation uh, group. So we had a workshop at the beginning of the year to sort of bring together the community that um, deals with Earth Observation, wants to work with Earth Observation in Julia, and so on and so forth, developers of packages. Um, and you know we made quite a fair, you know, a, 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 a bit of progress. Um, and I think there are several kind of data sets from the satellite that you can apply. Um, those that uh, sense um, the surface topography can be one. Um, those that sense, um, um, you know, ocean color. If you're familiar with this, uh, ocean color is a measurement of um, the reflectance of kind of the sun on the uh, on the ocean, if you like. Um, so those give. Um, can give hints, you know, at the global scale, um, 
as to what happens to coral. Uh, I think there are dedicated scientific projects that observe them much more originally um, that you know, I would love to plug into this, but it's not been done yet. Any further questions? Then I would have one more. Um, can you elaborate a bit more on the connection between data and the models? What is it? Is it, is it just parameter fitting, or are you using neural ODEs, or uh, how do you use the data for in, in order to, um, to optimize your models or to make them better? Right. Um, so it sort of depends on, on, on the project. Um, over the years, I've been involved with a bunch of different things. Um, the, one of the, the, the big ones, maybe, uh, is a project that's now continued by NASA uh, that produced this ocean reanalysis. And so that is using, currently, um, in fact, a Fortran model uh, that has a automatic differentiation with it. And so we do that kind of a big curve fitting exercise in that one. That includes parameter optimization, boundary surf surface boundary conditions, something like that. In other projects, um, what I'm looking at is um, taking the, the particle tracking devices and training them from the data. I'd like to learn about you know the the, the dispersive statistics there. Um, the third one is more related to uh, neural networks in a way, and so trying to go from um, you know, uh, models that represent something like the mine ecosystem, a complicated thing, and, and, and predict from their observables, right? So that's one step in there as well. Um, does that help? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> okay, you. so let's thank, thank the speaker again.